Howdy, good morning. All right, we're going to begin. I know people will be joining a little bit after and that's okay, but I wanna be respectful of our time today. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. So on behalf of Pass the Publication, howdy and welcome. Pass the Publication is a professional development workshop that focuses on various topics, including publishing, writing, research and grants, and the graduate student experience. This platform provides distinguished guests opportunities to share their insights and expertise in hopes to move all of us forward in our own writing agendas and publications. This workshop is supported by the Education Leadership Research Center, directed by Dr. Beverly Irby, the Center for Research and Development in Language and Literacy Acquisition, directed by Dr. Laura Alessio, as well as the Graduate Student Advisory Board. If along the way you have questions, you may type them in the chat for discussion at the end. Again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and learn with us. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Jia Wang. Dr. Wang is a tenured full professor at the Chair of the Adult Education and Human Resource Development. I'm sorry, I had to change the slide back, so I lost my spot. She's also the director of the AEHRD Training and Development Certification Program. As a scholar, Dr. Wong has been actively promoting individual, organizational, and national development through culture-sensitive and evidence-based research. Informed by the vision of her scholarship, Dr. Wong has examined critical and contemporary HRD issues in five interacting dimensions, international and national, and cross-cultural HRD, workplace learning, organizational crisis management, workplace incivility, and career and family issues. Her research has been funded by multiple agencies and disseminated through a diversity of channels, including academic and trade journals, book chapters, edited referred journals issues, and practitioner-oriented books, editorials, conference proceedings, and more than 160 international and national conference presentations. Dr. Wong served as one of four flagship HRD journals in the Human Resource Development Review and as the associate editor of the 2014 to 2017 and later the editor in chief 2017 to 2022. Currently, she also serves as the editorial board for four HRD related international research journals. I know she has expertise that we can learn from today. So I'm gonna welcome Dr. Wong in on behalf of the past publication. I'm excited to hear about her topic as a young PhD student and somebody who's trying to develop their writing. And I'm gonna hand it over to her. Thank you for joining us this morning, Dr. Wong. Thank you for having me. Okay, so now I'm gonna share my screen. And hello everyone. I see some of the familiar faces, a lot of my students. Thank you for being here to support. It's funny enough this evening I'm teaching literature review. Our final topic is writing, right? <laughs> so I hope I'm not gonna repeat a lot of stuff so to bore you. Let me share my screen uh, to start with. Let me know if you can see my screen. We've got it. Yay, that's always the challenging part. It's been really difficult to really choose the topic because writing is my passion. I'm thinking, what am I gonna choose the topic that will have a lifetime a challenging meaning, right? So are you a responsible writer? That's not a question I'm asking you alone. I'm also asking myself on a daily basis. So I'm excited to share with you some of the uh, my personal observations, lessons learned, mistakes I've made, and some success tips. Okay, so I wanna share with you to start with my personal belief, right? I believe Research, no matter how well designed and conducted, would not be meaningful if it's not shared with the public. And I want you to think that for a little moment. I wrote an editorial uh, in 2019 when I was the editor for Human Resource Development Review. It became such an emotional journey for me, not only because as a writer, as a reviewer, but also as an editor, to really look at how many things we can take control over, we can't, right? But ultimately, as graduate students, it's particularly for doctoral students, and I want you to think about why am I here doing research? In addition to that PhD degree, which is your ultimate goal, your goal is to produce knowledge that will not only advance the research, the world of research, but more importantly, to improve the practice. So if you don't publish, nobody's going to benefit from your research. That's my firm belief to start with. 
So my identity, of course, I can give you lots of my identity, right? But my, in a context of writing, my identity is a professional writer. And I want you to think for a moment, have you ever thought about yourself as a professional writer, even as a graduate student? No, right? When the first time I was assistant professor, I was asked this question, what is your identity? I'm thinking, I'm a researcher, I'm a teacher, I'm a mother, I'm a woman, I'm an international faculty, I can go on and on and on. I'm a wife, I'm a many different things, right? But what is my identity as a researcher? What is my identity as a faculty member? I'm a professional writer. That thought scared me. <laughs> if you think about it, my gosh, I'm a writer. I Can I really do this, right? But at the same time, during the past 20 years, I realized, huh, I'm a writer, but I'm more a storyteller, right? If I think about that, that has more fun and excitement in that, right? I'm a storyteller. I'm telling the story of my research. Ah, can we do that? Every one of us tells stories every day, right? You tell stories to your spouse, to your friends, you tell stories during conversation. Now in an academic research context, I just have to tell my story in a very robust way, in an academic yet easy to understand way, right? So we can all work towards being a good storyteller and being a very exciting storyteller. So I wanna share with you those, uh, my force, uh, first and foremost identity as a professional, professional academic. Okay, I wanna share quickly my path. As you can see, I couldn't find something to be more fancy. So it looks very linear, but it's not a linear process. But that gave you a little bit idea about snapshots of who I am as a writer. Starting from a very young age, I was always a reader, right? I, I love to read a children's digest growing up in China. Every month I was just looking for the, my mom's subscription for a children's digest. I couldn't wait to read every month. That's the only thing, right? Only entertainment. We didn't have TV. We didn't have anything else. We didn't have iPhone for sure. We didn't have many magazines. That was my thing, that there's so many stories. I couldn't wait to see those stories. And also, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, going up in China, we receive our textbook ahead of time, right? So summertime, the teacher will give you textbook. First thing I was doing, just looking for all the stories we're going to have to read, right? And I would read all the stories, then I will leave the boring conceptual pieces later on. So reading did not, I did not realize how much reading has influenced me, but it was just part of me, DNA, I love reading. And being able to read absolutely helped you writing, right? So from my young age, I was, I call myself a creative writer. Doesn't mean I'm a fancy writer. I write my diary every day. I still have diaries every day. And I'm thinking my husband and I talk about what I'm gonna do with my over a hundred actual hard copies of my diary, right? Who is gonna have them? And yes, that's my, my job when I retire. I'm going to write my all stories because each diary have many stories. So creating write, writing to me is um, disciplined, not disciplined writing, and just follow my heart, write my emotions. Even during the past two years, I did 45 days of uh, creative writing. I was so angry about pandemic. I was frustrated, I was tired. So that become my therapy, really to work through my emotions. I produced amazingly in 20, uh, 45 days, I produced 25,000 words. I recently just shared with my mentor. He said, oh my gosh, John, I know a different side of you. I said, yeah. It's my therapy, it's my deepest feeling. But after I was writing with the hope it's going to be a research piece in some fashion. It doesn't have to be peer reviewed, but it has to be shared with the public. So to me, creative writing gave me the passion and motivation. I can write anything. My very first publication, don't laugh at me, <laughs> was in, when I was in high school, wouldn't believe, and there is a call for one sentence, right? Like one sentence, quotable sentence. I was thinking so hard. I'm thinking, I'm going to have my first publication. And guess what? I have this one sentence in the collection of 1,000 sentences. That was my very first publication. I was, I couldn't be proud of one sentence publication. Yay, I did it, right? So later on, I became a business writer. I think I'm thinking all of us have to do business writing in one stage of our life, especially when we went to the workplace. Whether you like it or not, I was working in Africa. I was working as a liaison uh, for a civil engineering project. So I, I wrote a lot of business letters, right? It's 
it was challenging to start with, but it gave you, once you learn the game, you understand, right? There's certain jargons you use, certain format. And coming to academia was by accident because I wasn't planning to be a professor, but knowing I love writing and I think I'm lucky enough to be in a place where I caught my professional calling. To academia, a bumpy. I always describe myself, my love relationship with writing is I love it, but also I hate it. I have this strong, intense feelings, right? I would do everything to delay because writing requires a lot of brain work. I know I'm cooking, I'm thinking about why do I want to write this? I'm not convinced enough by myself yet. I delay, delay. I would do everything else but writing, right? I would tell my family, today's my writing day, but in afternoon 3 p.m., my son would say, mom, why are you still back in the floor? Why are you doing the laundry? <laughs> because I'm trying to delay, it's difficult. But I also learned academic writing is something you can learn. It's like you're playing a game, there are certain rules. Actually become an academic writer is not that difficult as I imagine. once you know the jargon, know the rule. However, become a good academic writer, it's a lifetime journey, right? So my writing past in the process of trying to become a good or better academic writer, I also engage in other activities like being a journal reviewer, right? Being a conference reviewer, being reviewed for anything, for manuscript for students' work. And surprisingly and happily surprised, in those process of reviewing other people's work, you realize how easy you can critique other people's work, right? How easy you can find faults in other people's work. Yet, when I look at your paper, when I look at mine, every single word needs to say because it's my baby. Who's gonna say your baby is ugly? I have the most beautiful baby, right? So in the process of reviewing other people's work, it become a constant reminder. Okay, Ja, you're critiquing other person not writing clearly. Are you writing clearly? You're critiquing other people not being logical. Are you being logical, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I was associate editor for three years and then later become the editor for three years. So those six years as an editor really, really become a learning experience for me. I think, I don't know if my writing become a better, I can't say that, but my writing has definitely become more intentional, right? And everything I hold other people, my other authors accountable, I use them to hold myself, uh, as myself. So my current goal, <laughs> as you can see, is an ongoing process. I, I am a professional writer, but I'm, I'm learning to be a stylish writer. And I encourage you, if you are a doctoral student, don't try yet. <laughs> I waited until I became a, associate professor, I was talking to a friend, I said, I can't just write this boring technical report. I, I can't do that. I want to be stylish. You know, I want to be spicy up. So what can I do? See, oh, yeah, yeah, there's a Helen Sword. The author had a book called Stylish Writing, right? I've been reading that book, but very slowly. So my goal is to, I will be able to write not just for other editors, journal editors, my colleagues in the academia. I want to be able to write to a wide uh, range of audience, right? So I've been writing uh, blog posts for a metal industry. So I've been writing every month, I'm writing seven to 800 words. That's the that's the maximum people can pay attention to your reading, right? I'm writing with no any academic jargon. I'm writing like conversational. So I'm exploring a lot of different ways. I'm writing for trade journals, right? So I'm, in the next few years, I wanna write more for newsletters. So there are different ways to disseminate my research. I wanna be creative. So my motivation, uh, my motivation for this particular topic, and I have motivations for many topics, so this is just one of them. It was really, uh, my editorial published uh, in 2019 was really motivated by the, all the journal articles, uh, manuscripts we received and that's rejected. And once HRDR became a, a, in, a SSCI index journal, and actually our impact factor went up so happily, crazily, right? So we went from two point, uh, 0 0.0.87 when I took over become 2.67 when I left. Now we are way above 6.4, right? So you can see in the process of uh, having more impact as a journal, we receive more manuscripts. But I have to see out of all manuscripts, 60% of them, um, maybe 40% of them were just reject by me. And it's not because I have the authority to reject them because there's so many issues you know there is no, there's no way, there's no way I'm going to back my reviewers who are volunteers to waste their time to work on something that's not 
worthy of our attention, right? So I want to point out a few issues that are not inclusive, but they are very prominent issues are coming over and over again. For example, the major issues I've seen throughout my six years is conceptual flaw, right? That's a bigger issue. Conceptually, I don't see the reason why. I don't understand why this issue needs to be accepted. Then I've seen methodological flaw. A lot of people will say, for example, I'm doing a systematic literature review, yet you don't give us the detailed methodology. Or I'm doing a qualitative, uh, uh, qualitative work, yet you're using all the language of quantitative, right? So you give us an uh, idea, you don't understand the methodology. Then another thing which is the most challenging one, even for me, is really lack of newness. What's new about my work, right? And I think that's something we all have to struggle all the time. Even for me now, there's a topic, I have so many passions, but I don't really know is that worth it? Oh, other people have done that. Why do I need to do another one, right? It's very, very difficult. You have to do a lot of thinking. So those are the major things that are worth being death reject. And surprisingly, I got, I realized I didn't know that, how emotional I became <laughs> as an editor when I was reading man, manuscript. The, the reasons that trigger my emotions are not those major issues. They are the minor issues. For example, illogical structure. We constantly receive manuscripts, you can tell. This is a manuscript ma formatted for management journal. We're in HRD, we use APA, right? Every journal has very different, different uh, formatting guidelines. You can tell people don't even bother. They have sections one, section one, two, three, and we've never known such use that structure. Why don't you even bother, right? Why don't you even bother to tailor that to our journal? And grammar mistake, you know, what is the excuse? When I was reading, I'm thinking, John, don't be so harsh. Then on the other hand, I'm telling myself, what is my excuse for the author? When you submit a journal, you even have grammar mistake. We have an automatic grammar check. We have grammar lead. We have so many ways to, to help you. There's no excuse. Like you're going to, going to a job interview, your first job interview, you're in your pajama, right? Or you forgot to wear a tie if you're wearing a suit, right? And the formatting I've just mentioned. So you, uh, there's so many minor issues you can control and yet you didn't. What does that mean is that reflect really poorly on who you are as a person. That shows me as an author, you don't respect your own work. So why do I spend time on the piece of work you don't even respect yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a harsh reality. So it gets really emotional. I'm thinking another implication to me is if you cannot handle things that small, you can easily control how can I trust you, your ability to address bigger issues later on. When you reviewers feedbacks come back, they are mainly is related to conceptual issues, methodological issues, and lacking of significance issues. Because all the reviewers are being are reminded over and over again by editorial team, you don't reject, you don't reject article, you don't reject, uh, make decision for not accepting based on minor issues. Even there are a lot of minor issues, but if the idea is innovating, worth pursuing, we're gonna pursue, right? But by having so many problems to start with, certainly the very bad first impression. So a lot of times I would send it right back to the author. We added actually as an editor, we didn't have that uh, option before. But we, yeah, when I become editor, we added resubmit, revise and resubmit. That's one step before we reject you. I would say, I love your idea. I love your topic. I love everything. However, there's too many issues that distract attention. It's not worth wasting the time. Please fix the issue. One, two, three, four, five, right? So I gave them option to fix them. Hey, what happened? Okay, cool. All right, so next one. Suddenly it's not moving. Okay, so I wanna talk really about my, my key action today is what does that mean to be a responsible writer, right? We can all see I'm very responsible. I'm spending half a year working on this, but are you truly a responsible writer? And we hate to be our worst enemy, but I think when it comes to writing, I would encourage each one of us to be our worst enemy to start with. Otherwise, other people will be your worst enemy, right? <laughs> You'd rather be harsh on yourself instead of letting other people be harsh on yourself. So I wanna talk about three different aspects. Uh, number one, being responsible means critically assess your work to ensure quality. And I would elaborate what does that really mean, being critical. And number two, seek feedback, not just from your advisor, 
not just from your instructor, from multiple resources, right, sources. And the finally understand the requirement of the target journal, the journal you are going to submit to work. Now my clicking is not working, so I have to go this way. All right, so let me talk quickly. Assess your work critically. As doctoral students, or even as the faculty ourselves, I always ask myself, what is my quality checklist? Do I have one? And you know, the easiest place you can go to is the journal. If you have a target journal or you have a conference paper, right? You want to submit a conference paper, you will have a guideline from the conference uh, organizing team, from the journal editorial. Read their journal and say, okay, they have their specific quality, right? However, whether you're doing conceptual paper, literature review, quality study, quantitative, qualitative, quantitative mixed methods, it doesn't matter what type of research. Research share a lot in common, right? I've always firmly believed I don't have to be a quantitative expert in order to judge the quality as long as I know the structure. Like you're building a house, you have to have a solid foundation. You have to have a well thought about framework. Otherwise, your house will collapse, right, very soon. So let me share with you eight different uh, criteria I've been looking throughout the years. I really look at so many different journals and different experiences as a writer, and I'm going to give you eight which I consider universal across disciplines, across different types of research. Now my clicker is now. Okay, so number one is really when you look at your work, think about research problem, right? What's the, secret, what's the need for my research? What's the purpose? That's the part I always try to hold you back. You know, we all have passion. We immediately wanted to jump into our passion, right? But I always try to hold you back, wait a minute. This is the area you need to spend most amount of the time, right? You do this amount of the time. So in order to have a very good, a solid foundation to start with. So the questions I would like for you to ask yourself is, do I identify research problem clearly? And pay attention, research problem is not your my research passion. I'm passionate about engagement during a virtual hyping hybrid work environment. That's my passion. But what is the problem? That's a that's a passion, right? That's a phenomenon. The engagement engagement in virtual environment is just a phenomenon. The problem could be ah people lose motivation, managers lose control, and we don't know how to trace productivity. We don't know how to measure productivity or we don't have enough literature to give us the guidance, right? Because this is an emerging new phenomenon. So ask yourself, okay, now here are the issues. The issues are practical issues because companies and organizations struggle. But the issues also has to be academic issue, right? Because we don't have literature to inform our understanding. So spend adequate time to really convince yourself, right? I'm always having to convince myself, come to the point, I'm gonna tell myself, Okay, John, I can tell you if if Jordan bump into me in the elevator and say, Dr. Wang, what are you studying now? Why do you study this? I'm gonna say, Jordan, here are the three problems, one, two, three, right? I have to be that crystal clear in order for me to move forward to the next step. And then the step, next step is really, do I have a compelling justification, right? A lot of times journal articles get desk reject. It's not because they're not well written. It well, amazingly, they'll be fancy, Fancy formatting, lots of tables, a lot of visuals, but they're great. But there's just something, I don't even understand why do we need this in the firm. You need to make justification. You have to sell your idea. So I've always seen myself as a salesperson. I'm selling this product. My product is my research. I'm convincing you why it's worth being read, right? It's worth being published. So you have to, the same way you're, once you have problems, you will be able to make compelling justification, right? And also very importantly, in order to do so, you have to do some preliminary literature review, right? You have to understand literature, what's being done, what's not being done. Then the next thing I see is, now I know my the problem out there I wanna solve. I've also made a strong case for my research. Now I'm gonna tell you logically, I'm gonna tell you, therefore, here's the purpose of my study or of my research. I've always tell people, a good writer, uh, you don't have to tell me. A good writer, as a reader, I will be able to say, ah, I've just read, read your purpose statement, uh, your problem statement, your justification. Now, without you telling me, I can derive your purpose statement, right? I know exactly what you're going to do. 
And a lot of times when I read the purpose statement, I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I know you're going to study this, but in your introduction, everything else, you didn't touch that. Or you've touched most, most of it, but there's a new concept, idea, or construct you introduce your purpose you never even talk about, right? So there is a logical flow in this process, and I would encourage all of us to spend time on this process. You can do so by walking on campus. You can do so when, while you're eating, but always ask yourself, why do I need this? Why do I need it? How can I tell people it's worth it, right? Mouse. Oh, so my mouse just take me for that. Okay. The second aspect, once you finish that section, if you can imagine, uh, is you're writing your introduction section, right? You're writing your introduction rationale, then you finish your, pur uh, your purpose. Now you're going to tell yourself, what are the questions I'm going to ask? And sometimes you may not see questions, but most of the time, questions need to be there, right? Depends on your what type of uh, research you're doing. It could be hypothesis for quantitative study, research questions for qualitative, for literary review, for conceptual pieces. Then ask yourself, are these questions meaningful? Or worth, meaningful means, is that worth using research to answer? A lot of times, for example, my, I give example, I'm making up a story. Here's an example. Our students, uh, most of the students uh, represent diversity. I'm thinking, no, you don't need a, systematic research in order to answer. It's a survey question. It's actually a demographic question, right? You don't need to make it a research question. Or a lot of times we ask yes or no question. That's not, a, for example, if, uh, okay, if we motivate people, they're going to be more engaged. Okay, is that a meaningful question? Yes. Is that, need, do, do we need to answer? Not really, because literature already told us. Yeah, so a lot of hypotheses already answered. We don't need to, to answer. We already know something we already know, right? So writing your questions also, you have to take some time, right? And make sure those questions, that, that goes to the second point. Your questions have to lead to additional knowledge that will add contribution. And at the end of the day, the reason we are writing a research, published research, is because we're telling something we don't know yet, right? If you're simply telling something we already know, why do we waste our time and energy? Regional piece, right? So that's the question you need to ask yourself. And the finally, of course, the cosmetic, but also very important. Did I present my questions very clearly? What does that mean? A lot of us love, love to write long sentences. I'm one of them. <laughs> Early on in my career, I always, I didn't do that on purpose, but I just write sentences that are really complicated. I'm thinking, look at me, I'm a doctoral student. I was very sophisticated, right? So we'll add a compound structure, this with that. Take me five breaths to reach through your question. You know it's not good, right? If you finish reading your questions or your purpose statement or anything, you have to say, wait a minute, why did I just read? Let me come back to read. You know you didn't do a good job, right? So when you write research question, you should have one idea for question. It should be as simple as possible. What are some words you can take away from your sentence that still maintain the entirety of the meaning, right? So be very critical. Don't add words that are not necessary. I don't know why my, okay, let me go this way. So now you can, if you're visualizing with me the process, the structure of the paper, now you just finished background information, you finished rationale, you finished my purpose and questions. Now you're gonna give us a, some we call theoretical foundation, or sometimes we call literature review, sometimes we call theoretical context or theory guiding frameworks, however you want to call that. The, the bottom line here is you need to ground your research work in the existing knowledge, right? You need to show, showcase, I know what's out there already. In order to tell people what's not out there, you have to know what's out there first, right? So ask yourself, do I cite all the relevant research that will inform my topic? A lot of times, depends on the topic, have many constructs. You may have to cite multiple constructs, but the bottom line is make sure if whatever is your core phenomenon, you want to cite all the relevant literature. That means the relevant literature doesn't mean it's the literature in your field only, right? The relevant literature meaning who has been studying those? What fields have studied that? For example, when uh, my one of my colleagues I did a topic on crisis management. We are the first one to say in HRD we're looking at the role of HRD in crisis management. 
If we look at the HRD literature, we can barely find any literature, right? However, if we look at the management literature, a disaster literature, gee, the literature is abundant. So, so what reviewers, what good research will do is to ground your topic in all the relevant literature say, okay, these fields have done this, 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 this. However, our field hasn't touched this topic. And here's the reason why we need to understand that, right? So you need to show that understanding and give you a sad example. <laughs> Two days ago, one of our, my former students uh, dissertation, we we're converting to a few journal articles. Uh, we identify a target journal. It was rejected within a day. That's reject, excuse me. The reason is you did not cite anything in our journal, in our uh, journal, right? So to to them, oh, your topic is you're sending it to us, but we have published, but you didn't cite anything in our field. So why do you send it to us, right? So make sure, make sure you really identify all the relevant literature, right? You need to include. And what are the theories or conceptual frameworks? you're going to use to support your research. A lot of times we use excuse, right? We're doing quality work, we don't have theoretical framework, but don't use that as an excuse. Just because you don't have the specific theoretical framework doesn't mean there are not theories that inform you thinking about your topic, right? Sometimes I remember for my dissertation, I never have one specific theory, but I touched on every aspect of the literature. If it's management, I look at management literature. Right, if it's a uh, economic, so when looking at management uh, behavior change in the context of a changing economy, so I will talk about culture aspect. Uh, I will look at the literature on economics. I look at literature on managers. Look at literature on management. Right, so there are multiple. There are some theories that inform you. So what are they? Okay, so next thing is. If you visualize with me, you go into your next stage, it's really research design, right? That's the area, there's no specific rule, but if you know your, your specific methodology, you need to make sure there is an alignment. The first, before you do so, the first question is ask yourself, do I use the best methodology that will address my questions most effectively? You can't choose something just because I feel like, right? And, and today, believe it or not, the, the journal reviewers have become more and more demanding. It's not because they're not reasonable, because they really want to know more about your rationale, right? Because you don't tell them. So tell them why, even if you say, I'm writing a conceptual paper. Why this is a conceptual paper, right? Because this is the goal. So that's where when you present your purpose, people kind of know, oh, this purpose will drive my selection of a method of methodology. We're looking for this alignment. Do I see alignment between your purpose, nature of your purpose, the nature of the questions, and the methodology, right? Is there a fit, right? And do I use robust methodology? For example, I'm giving a simple example. If you say I'm doing a systematic literature review, integrative literature review, immediately editors and reviewers look for the several pages of a detailed description, look for a Prisma guideline, look for the you know, the specific keywords, the databases, right? If you're not doing those, you are giving a message you don't understand that, right? If you say, I'm doing a qualitative phenomenological study, immediately we're looking for, are you using deep individual interviews? Do you understand phenomenological study? There is a huge piece of apple shade, a triangulation, right? So there are certain jargons, certain techniques associated with each. What do you do for data collection? What do you do for data analysis? there is alignment we're looking for. How do you know about that alignment that comes from the knowledge from your research courses, right? <clears throat> okay, so the next one, I use the result slash findings. Uh, this is me, you can just, you can only quote on me. <laughs> Don't take that as a yes or no absolute truth, right? So I typically use the word results for quantitative studies. I use words findings for qualitative studies you never really use them together, right? Because a lot of times you would see people, results slash findings. And then I'm thinking, make a decision. Results or findings, tell us, right? Um, so were your results logical and reflect methods? And that's, again, we're looking for alignment. Right? If you do interviews, I'm expecting to see some qualitative themes. I'm expecting to see the right quotes, some stories, little narratives to incite it. If using quantitative, I'm lumping everything into one, right? I'm looking for some tables. 
graphics, right? So are you showing us your adequate knowledge of the methods and methodology? And most of all, the second one is do your research question get answered, right? A lot of times, even for one time, my, one of my dissertation students, we realized by the time we're ready to go to the final defense, we have 80 pages of findings, but out of 80 pages findings, 20, 85% of them focus on question number one. There's very little data on question number two. And sometimes you're gonna find, oh my gosh, there's an emerging interesting idea, right? which is not part of my question, right? I, one of my students' dissertation, we look at instability, but at the end of the day, there's an emerging data, which very important, very interesting, but which was not one of the questions we asked. So you wanna make sure, you may want to go back to see is that worth representing this? Maybe I need to tweak my question. Sometimes people say, can I change my questions? When I finish my study, absolutely, right? Your the process of as long as you're still working on your work, it's a work in progress. You can tweak and change any part of it before you submit, right? Because it's a, it's alignment issue. Then the next thing is the report with logic and clarity. To me, that's called issues easy to be controlled. That means how do you control? How do you use headers? Please use generally at least two levels of patterns, right? But I would encourage for doctoral work, always give three levels of patterns. Do you give transitional sentences? I'm very big on using opening sentences to tell us in this section, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna represent five, report five things. They are, or well, use tables. How can you give people easy way to follow your train of thought? Visual, always a very powerful tools. A transitional sentence, a very powerful tools. So make, writing easy to follow, your writing. The next thing I think it's more dis, uh, challenging is discussion, right? By the time we, read, we finish this much of the writing, we are exhausted, right? And now, now we have to really think about, okay, now what does my data tell me? How do I make sense? This is where we really answer the question, so what? Right, so what question, instead of having other people ask you, you need to ask yourself first, right? What does this data mean? This is where you, ground your data, ground your understanding into the literature. Now I have this data, let me compare to literature. Ah, did I find something new or did I find something inconsistent? Did I find contradictory data? What does that really mean? This is where you, for the first time as a researcher, you have your voice. This is where we look for, are you able to think critically? Are you able to make interpretation in a very critical way, right? So it's not a mere repetition of your findings. A lot of times people do that. It's not a summary of your findings. Sometimes people just in discussion give a very nice, nicely done table, summarize all the findings and think, okay, it's just another visual way. So what does this finding tell us? Perhaps you can draw, you can critique, right? You can say, I've noticed there are five trends in a current study. However, I've noticed nobody has done this and this and this, right? Perhaps you can critique. Perhaps you can look for trends. Perhaps you can come up with a new conceptual framework. Perhaps you can give us some research propositions, right? Think of multiple ways to discuss your findings. So the key is we're looking for a higher level synthesis, right? Higher level thinking, not a summary of your findings. And this is the uh, section, please take your time, right? Take your time to think. And a lot of times we have to do multiple revisions, right? You can say, oh, I don't, I think I need to come up with a framework. That's my contribution. This is where you ask yourself, force yourself say, what is my contribution through this research, right? This is where you brag about your contribution. The finally it goes to contribution, actually they go hand in hand, right? Are you adding a new framework for us to think about? Are you touching, identifying new area we haven't tapped into? Have you, are you giving any practical advice to, to people in the practitioner's world, right? So, what am I uh, contributing to the literature? This is the area you need to crystal clear. Because a lot of times people say, oh, I don't want to brag. And you do. If you don't brag about it, if you as a salesperson, you don't talk about what am I selling, what's the benefit of what I'm selling, nobody's going to sell for you, right? So be very clear. Oh, I'm going backward because of my mouse. And finally, I want to talk about this is the area which can trigger emotion. This is area you show who you are as a writer, what kind of writer you are, is the quality of writing, right? Is that clear? 
I don't know if you have a habit of read out loud. I do. Everything I do, even my husband sitting here, we're looking at my work and say, can we read it out? Because when you read it out loud, when you hear yourself, you can hear the problems. You can hear, it doesn't make sense, right? This sentence is way too long. I can't even breathe. I need to take two breaks in order to understand what I wrote, right? So read your work out loud. And did I give a consistent story? To me, remember I said, we are storytellers. Even when writing technical report, we're still telling a story, right? So what is the story? The story always have an opening. The story has a main, main body, the content. The story has an ending. Do I have all the components? Am I making a logical sense to make the story, right? Not only do I follow, I want a journal format, but that's a big turn off when we don't put energy to itself it reflects very poorly on who we are as authors. I'm watching my time and Jordan, am I doing okay with my time? Yes, ma'am. Let's shoot for five more minutes so we have time for questions. Sure, absolutely. So the next thing is really, I think the most time we need to spend energy is on the part I've just shared. That's perhaps our biggest task, right? The next thing, the next couple of things is seeking feedback. I don't know if you seek feedback. If you haven't, start to ask yourself your question. Am I seeking feedback from many people? To me, there are three types of feedback you need to think about. Criteria-based feedback, I call readers-based uh, feedback and content-based feedback, right? So who are the people who can give you criteria-based feedback? your allied readers, your family members, your favorite friends, your spouses, your, uh, your somebody you feel very safe, somebody you feel like they're not gonna see you just writing stupid pace, you're writing pieces, you're making nonsense, right? Somebody you feel safe, gave them to, uh, to say, oh, can you tell me the quality, right? Can I read this, right? Can you, can you focus on one thing? Do you understand what I'm writing? That could be somebody completely not from your field, just to give you an idea, do we understand, right? Uh, <clears throat> so readers-based feedback, great editors, please, this is not journal editors. These are the editors, uh, professional editors for wordsmithing, for grammar, for other type of communication, right? So I sometimes we encourage a lot of our international students or even domestic students, please hire professional editors to read through your work and clean up. A lot of times my students give me dissertation work. They will say, Dr. Wang, please, please just ignore my grammar. It's terrible. My writing is terrible. Just ignore it. Just focus on the content. I'm saying, I can't because your grammar is so bad. It distracts me. I can't even follow your logic, right? So have somebody who must read it through to give you an idea. But finally, this is probably the most challenging part is the content-based feedback. This is where your advisor comes into play. This is where your uh, the domain expert, the people, big leading scholars in your name, in your field, who are the content expert of your topic comes into play. So you wanna make sure you give them something that's worth their time to comment. So you need to already clean up your writing messiness, right? The logic. Now you're going for them to ask them, can I, can you give me advice on the content? And hopefully you're doing all those in the process of developing your manuscript, not when it's done, right? When it's done, it's very, it's going to be really emotional. The content expert said, you know what? You're completely off track, right? So those should be a continuously ongoing process for you. Okay, the final one, I don't want to go into detail, but there are three major common mistakes I've seen. I've based my decision to reject on any of those or combination of those uh, common mistakes. Number one is people tend not to make a connection to the journal. I'm coming from a field of HRD, so I'm using HRD as example. HRD is very multidisciplinary. We can write things relevant to management, psychology, sociology, you name it. And it's your job, if you focus on our journal, HRD, you need to make a connection, say why this piece needs to be read by audience in the HRD community. A lot of times people send us journal, not even mention the word HRD. I'm thinking, why? Do you understand the field? And a second thing I immediately look at, do you cite anything published in our journal? If you didn't cite, you, it's better because you, after your systematic review or comprehensive review, you didn't find any articles publishing this in my journal, right? In this journal, therefore, you're not citing, right? You better have a rationale. It's not because, oh, I didn't know I need to cite yours. 
And then finally, how much knowledge you know about the journal. Sometimes it's worth have a conversation with the journal editors. Don't be afraid. People say, oh, I'm a student. Why do I have a conversation with the editor? I give you a perfect example. When I was an assistant professor, first year, I was writing an article to HRD, Human Resource Development Quarterly. It was a qualitative piece. The editor gave me feedback, say, oh, you talk about your interview protocol. Did you do the interview standing up or do you do the interview when you're sitting down? I was mad. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? If you want me to address every single thing you ask me, my 8,000 words limit will become doubled, right? How many times will your paper become longer and longer? Do I really need to? Guess what? I was scared. I was a new professor, but I said, you know what? Let me just email her, say, can I have a quick conversation with you to clarify some of your thoughts? I want to address them, but I don't know how. She said, doesn't matter, okay, I'm vacuuming my floor. You want to talk to me? Now talk to me. I can hear the vacuum cleaner in the background, but she was talking to me. She said, you know, what I didn't mean is, I don't mean you really have to tell me you're sitting down or standing up, but you get the idea is I want that level of detail, but I didn't get the idea, right? I'm thinking you literally want those. So have that conversation with the editor. Send your preliminary work, say, is this something you're even looking for, right? And but make sure you send the work that represents the best of you. So you don't waste everybody's time. You don't misrepresent who you are and your quality. Then finally, I think for your reflection, you don't have to reflect now, but when you leave today, think about, I want you to ask yourself two questions. Based on what I shared today, uh, it's only one person's opinion. Do you consider yourself a ready uh, responsible writer, right? If not yet, or if not complete, what is your action plan to become one? What is the first step you can take? I'm giving you the first step, <laughs> just, just my own editorial. I think some of students here today already read because you're in my literature review class. It's becoming a responsible writer. It's a very easy to, to read article. It's only a few pages because it's an editorial. It's only three pages of content, but give you a lot of things to think about. So for your immediate action, I hope you will read that. If you can't sleep tonight, this is going to be your bedtime reading. Okay. So thank you very much for listening to my experience. And I'm open to some dialogues and questions and comments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. That thank was you. really a helpful presentation. Thank um, you. If you're ready and you would like to ask some questions of Dr. Wong, please drop them in the chat. Or and like raise your little hand on don't, Zoom. Don't be shy. <laughs> Many of you know me. I know yeah, you. you have an invaluable resource here. I know my support system, right? I'm no questions. Because yeah, I'm giving I, some time. That um, just means you were very. I concise. do have one. Oh, here's Doctor <laughs> Abdulrahman. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, Dr. Wang, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Actually, you covered a lot of things that um, the editor sometimes experience with like publications when the uh, when they receive like submissions from um, students or um, or scholars, as you said, like we are like responsible to be writers. Um, so from the editor point of view because i'm editing like some journals mm -hmm. um you mentioned that it's um uh, the the authors should add some of the citations off from the journal that I, they are sending to it right actually right. sometimes i see like some authors that do not the not side like the advancing women leadership the journal i'm editing right and i feel sometimes like is it appropriate to ask them Absolutely. Or not. So, Absolutely. Um, it's, yeah. Thank you, Nahed. That's a great question. I think it also depends on different journals, right? Different journal editor. You will see each one of us have a different preference. But however, this is something I strongly believe. If you want to publish in our journal, you need to understand our journal. I give you an example. When I was editor, 60% of the topics people submitted is engagement, right? Engagement, leadership. Those are two dominant topics. So people, you can tell they're not from HRD. So there was engagements being done in, in many different areas, but engagement is a topic we have published a lot in HRD field. 
and we have several big names to do engagement, not even cited. I'm thinking, you don't even know our field. So why do you public something we already published very, uh, very extensively, right? So I think it's absolutely our editor's uh, responsibility or say, we've already done this and this and this. Why do we need to know another piece we already know, right? I think it's a good challenge to the author to really think about what is your additional knowledge contribution to the journal? Awesome. And then I have another question and they liked it so much that they're asking, when will the recording be ready? I want to watch it again. So oh. we are working actually on a new hub system that will house all of our recordings and also other kind of like professional development or colloquium speakers. And um, that site isn't ready yet, but you can bet your bottom dollar I'll be advertising it when it is. And it will house all of our past to publication and some other um, programs that we have to offer where you can go back and you can rewatch. Or um, if you have to miss a presentation, you can go back and watch it. It's not ready yet, but like I said, we're actively working on it and I will be advertising it when it is ready. Thank you, you know, uh, thank you, Jordan. What you found is such a wonderful learning, even for yeah. me coming to many sessions, I learned a lot of new things myself. Thank you. May I ask another question? Sure. Please do my head. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Wang, um, I believe the students, when they follow your instruction, they will have a good draft for public for uh, as a manuscript to be sent to journals. So when they receive comments and feedback from the reviewers, would you please elaborate a little bit, like when the, what they need to do when they resubmit their paper, if they're asked for resubmission? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. I think the number one step is. <clears throat> We read through, right? We get really emotional. And I've always believed the more feedback I receive, the more grateful I am, meaning people really care about you, right? So first thing I think as authors, if we want to be in this in the long haul, if this is our lifetime commitment, we have to build a very uh, healthy relationship with the review. Because a lot of times when you go to journal, depends on the... When you go to journal, review feedback is very different from conference review feedback, right? Conference review is... You feel pretty good. Say, wow, I'm a great, I'm a great writer, right? People liked it. And I remember one of my papers where uh, one of the top 10 papers, I was so proud early on. I sent it out. The review was, couldn't be more overwhelming, right? So the first thing you, you do is you race through, you put them away for, for a few days. You don't look at them because we become very emotional engaged. We become resistant. I'm thinking, who do you think you are? You're insulting me. When I look at that two weeks later, I'm thinking, wow. This make a lot of sense. Then I immediately create a table, right? I create a table with two columns, reviewer feedback, author's action response. I copy paste every single, I don't leave out anything. I copy paste every single feedback. And each one will have only one component. I will have editor's feedback, reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three. It doesn't matter, it could be 10 pages long. Then I wanna make sure I, before I even address, I'm looking at the feedback. I'm writing notes already <clears throat> for myself. I said, oh, I'm not going to address this. Here's the reason why, right? I can already some, for example, there was please proofread your work. I see, thank you so much for the feedback. This work has been proofread. Hope we meet your expectation. There are some things you can easily say already and make sure you do proofread, right? <laughs> your work. And sometimes people ask you for a lot of things, right? But students get really frustrated. They ask me to do this and this and this. Yes, you, they're asking you, but you don't have to address all of them. But you do have to address to say, I respect, I respectfully disagree, but here's the reason why, right? It's being professional. You don't just get emotions. Or sometimes we take this, we take a chance to say, I have six pages of feedback, so I'm gonna address four pages or 80%. Reviewers will not know. Guess what? Reviewer will know. I have one of my reviewers came back to me in private, private communication say, I'm not gonna review this again. This person, author addressed half of my feedback, very, very disrespectful, right? Reviewers do know, so every single piece you need to justify. Sometimes it's also an education to, you are the educator, you know the content. Sometimes we don't always give you a very legitimate feedback. You will see contradictory feedback. Reviewer one, love it. Reviewer two, absolutely hate it. You can see there's a contradictory feedback. This is also the area you can go back to the journal editor and say, 
how do I deal with the feedback? Ha however, hopefully in your editor's letter, it will really reconcile the differences, right? Your editor will say, based on all the feedback, we want you to pay attention to these six major issues. Make sure every piece of feedback is addressed. Even when you say, that's a great question. I've always started with a very positive. Thank you so much for your detail, attention to detail. Well done, the well, your point is well taken. However, what you suggest is beyond the scope of my research for this article. I will incorporate suggestion in the direction for future research. There's always way, right? I will address that as a limitation, but you do address each one of them. Mm -hmm. So when you finish address, address uh, see all the comments, you write down, how do you address? I say, please see my introduction, completely rewrite, see page one, two, three. Or thank you for your point. You recommended this uh, publication to read. I've added to page two, right? You need to give that level uh, of pension mutually in the process. I think that's great too, because it helps you organize what you've already done when you're in the revise and resubmit process. Like, did I address this? Yes, here's Ooh. proof. Like that two table um, thing is very easy for editors to read, but it's also easy uh, for you to organize yourself. Absolutely, right? You don't want to give them... Yeah, a version just we have to look for. I think the one thing is for to be a smart maybe a writer is also how do I make the work easier for you, right? Mm -hmm. Think about if I have to read your work, I'm already bombarded. I have to read. Now I have to do the work you have in down. I have to do the guesswork. So you become a kind of emotional process. So if I'm smart enough, I'm going to write clearly. I'm going to tell you this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you here's the table. I address this page one or two. Mm -hmm. Make their job easier. Right. Okay. I have four questions and we'll oh go through them quickly. Yeah, you're okay. getting you're getting questions now that we're talking. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you a lot for the presentation. Can you kindly elaborate on what to do if you're struggling with the literature? And I'm guessing they mean with the lit review when a topic uh -huh. has not been studied a lot. And okay. I would benefit from this because I'm writing a paper right now that's not heavily covered in literature. So I'm struggling with that review. Okay, so here's the question, right? When your topic has not been studied a lot, that's a great thing. That means empirical study is warranted, right? If you say the topic hasn't been studied, I'm doing another literature review, it doesn't make sense. That means you need to do empirical study, exploratory empirical study, right? And if you're writing for a journal, um, it's, it's, you don't have to have a lengthy view, but in your uh, problem statement, make it very clear, right? Make it very clear. However, there are some theoretical knowledge out there, even that means uh, documents, conference proceedings, right? Books, that means you have to go beyond uh, traditional publications to look at maybe their trade journals talk about this issue, maybe their associations talking about this, maybe their government reports, maybe their United Nations reports. If you still cannot find perfect, that's the reason why I'm doing a empirical study. Right? So that shouldn't be a big, but you have to demonstrate first. I've actually exhausted literature in a different field. I have a good understanding people haven't done that. So be very careful when you make that argument. Nobody has done it. That's not true. Everything has been done. That's in a different field you didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. So be very careful when you make bold statements. You better be able to justify. Okay, here's another question. Um, thank you for the wonderful lecture. I feel insecure in my writing. I know I'm still learning, but how long does it take to feel ready? Sometimes I feel like I'm <laughs> progressing very little. I'm still not ready sometimes. When I get <laughs> every time <laughs> we recently got rejected, we, hmm, after 20 years, you will never be ready. Just like you want to become mom, you never be ready. You want to get married, you never be ready. But so live with that feeling of never be ready, right? But the key, I've always said, just do it. Just do it. Throw yourself out there in a battlefield. That's my favorite thing, right? When you do it, get feedback, you will become better and better, right? Mm -hmm. So just ignore your feelings. Say, that's that's normal. Even Jai is not secure. Mm -hmm. Kara McLean, my mentor, said, John, I got rejection. So, so, so what? The more rejection, meaning you try so many times, right? So just learn to accept that insecurity. It's a part of our DNA. Yeah. Okay. And I've got two more. I have one in the chat and then we'll end with one um, who wants to verbally comment. The one in the chat says, when responding to reviewers, after you've made this table with all of the changes you've made or your justifications, mm -hmm. how do you respond? Do you just email it to them? I feel like most of them have a system. 
right? You 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 actually upload. I normally will give two different versions, right? I will give a clean version. This is the revised version. I also give a, a track change version, right? Because a lot mm -hmm. of times your journal even asks for, we want to see track change version. We want to see a clean version. And your reviewers, most of the time, want to see the track change version, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to reread the whole thing. And so your table will give them a guideline. I will, as a reviewer myself, editor, I will look at the table. If they tell me they address this on page so which, which, I'm looking at pages, no, I don't see that. Then I'm looking at uh, also their track change. So again, make their job easy by giving different choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you don't know what a track change is, it's a setting in your Word at the top under review. When you mm -hmm. click it, it'll let your editors see, like it'll change the color and show all the changes you've made. And that is a feature on Word. Yes. Um, the Thank last you. one I have is a verbal one. So go ahead, Miss Wynn. Oh, we yeah. did. Yes, Dr. Wang. Thank okay. you so much for your great presentation. Um, so I can see how challenging it is to have a paper to be published. And I'd like to ask a question regarding our coursework assignments. And I think this is also the, the concern of a lot of like students like me. Like, do you think that we can develop our coursework assignments? and to make them like publishable? Absolutely. Every one of my students have developed the public first publications always from the course, either from a literature review course or from foundation, right? Your mm -hmm. very first course assignment may not be because you're learning how to write, may not be able to publish. But as you go through, I've always told my students, every piece should not be wasted. Even that means I can't publish, but you know, the literature review, I can take a chunk of this to develop a new paper. Don't ever waste anything, right? Every time you write, you write with publication as your end goal, right? And also here's another thing is it's being very strategic. Uh, obviously, if I'm writing my first paper, I'm not going for journal, which is the best journal in our field, right? <laughs> you are going for strategically. I've always sit down with my students. Okay, this piece, you know, this is my not my best piece. Right? I didn't spend a lot of time and energy. So I'm going with the uh, journal, which is lower ranking, relevant, lower ranking. But my goal is to experience my first success as a writer. I want to learn about the whole publication process, the review process, the uh, revision process. So let me go for the journal. There are many journals. That's where you work with advisors. They will say, let's go for this journal. Then once you become better and better, then you can go for higher level journals. Just be very strategic. I think do a lot of talking with your advisor will help you. Don't just make decisions on your own. You have resources you can go to. Right? Thank you so much. And, and also don't discourage yourself. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, some journals, it's not because your work is not good. For example, HRDR, we only publish 16 articles per year. We have over 200 papers to pick those 16. Doesn't mean yours is not good, but yours can be good for somebody else, right? So even they reject you, even the lower level reject you. That means I always say, don't ignore their feedback. Every time I got rejected, I look at the feedback, I say, oh, are there any uh, any comments I can address right now? If people, if they said, your question is not clear, you're not gonna send it out to another journal, meaning your question is truly is not clear. Fix it. If they completely ask you to redo a study, you don't do it. But you fix the problems you can, and you send it to another journal, right? You don't just wait for it or discourage and cry. Just take action. That's For me, it's all about action. Somebody beat me down, okay, clean up and become stronger. Do it again, right? That's the game we're in. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're very awesome. welcome. Awesome. Thank you so all much. Right. I have a lot of accolades in the chat about how clear and easy to follow your presentation was and how helpful yeah. it was. So I just want to thank you on behalf of all of our listeners and attendees. Thank you for presenting to us, Dr. Wong. I learned a lot. I'm sure thank our you. attendees did as well. And I want to wish the rest of our attendees a great rest of the day. And if you're international, I want to wish you a good night. And I will see y'all next semester. Be looking for emails from me and be looking for advertisements for our portal when we get it up. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. I can't even <laughs> come out of it. What happened? Uh, can you I cannot even leave the <laughs> sorry, Jordan.
No, I love you're you good. Too much. I'm not leaving. I, I usually I usually hang back for about five minutes to chat with our team and the oh. um, presenter okay. if they would like to chat. So okay, that's so okay. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna let everybody else go. Else yeah, I usually I usually I don't stay. See that function. Okay. I usually stay and let our attendees leave, and then I have a quick little just ah, thank you so much. Debriefing and, with yeah, me? Yeah. Okay. I will stay then. So I will leave the meeting now. Thank you so much, Dr. Wow. Welcome. welcome for you. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Bye. And my friends who are lingering, <laughs> I am going to remove you. <laughs> Bye. There's one more. Yeah, I've got him. Yay. There we go. Okay, Jordan, you know, I do apologize. I feel like I've rushed a little bit for the last two uh, parts. I, I spoke too much about the first one, then uh, uh, critical assessing. So when you told me if I, I was looking at time, thinking, Darren, you talk too much. I love this topic too much. Sometimes I just got carried away. I don't think it was an issue at all. I think okay. also like, I try to come with more than I want to speak about in case I go too fast Yeah, too sometimes, but yeah. I think it was great. I personally learned a lot and I know that I got a lot of comments in the chat about how much people really enjoyed this topic and this Thank presentation. You. And I think most people who are just starting, they need that front part anyway. Like that's yes. the, where do I start? How do I start? So right. the end stuff will come later, but it's just the courage to start and yes. to try and how do I do that? And I think that you captured that really well. Thank you. Thank you. I feel sad because a lot of them are students in my class this evening. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, please don't <laughs> count. Right? You're coming to my class this evening. It will be very similar because it's a writing, right? Literary review. <laughs> it's but our that final will be topic. great because they're going to be thinking about it all day yeah. and they're going to come with more questions. True. I'm, I, I'm going to say you being this morning session. Now you listen to the presentation one more time. What questions do you have? How do you think differently now? Yeah. Right? Or you can focus more on like the end part if they're like, oh, I'm in the middle of a paper. Right. But I think it went very well. And I thank you so much for mm -hmm. um, speaking with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I enjoy this very much. So awesome. in the future, if you need me again, let me know. Perfect. I will be <laughs> calling you in the future because I, I think it was a very helpful topic. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Jordan. I'll end the meeting. Bye. Yes, Thank you, please. Dr. Wong. Thank you.